Why does America have a defense industrial problem? Can you help me understand this? Yeah. Well, at the risk of, of making a long story long, I think you could think about like, when were we amazing at this? And I think it was really at the dawn of World War II. And there's this great book by Arthur Herman called The Arsenal of Democracy. It, it's, it's probably the book I'm most obsessed with right now. And I've read it a, a couple of times. And it really talks about how the industrial mobilization worked. We brought Bill Knudsen, a Danish immigrant who was a very senior executive at Ford and General Motors into government. We made him from a civilian to an army three-star general. You know, he was commissioned as a three-star general and he was in charge of the industrial mobilization. And we had this immense luxury during World War II, which was that we were at peace, Britain was at war and we were supplying Britain. We had 18 months when we were not getting shot at to turn on our industrial production, to build factories and to retool them. And that took 18 months. We needed that time. The counterfactual would have been brutal. Uh, we also needed to leverage American industry. We were at that time, we had just figured out mass production and we, America, had just figured out mass production. It was our unique strength in the world. So we applied that mass production technique not to Model Ts, we turned it to, to bombers and fighters and tanks and all the machinery of war you needed to actually help the Brits go forth and then subsequently to help, help, help America fight as well. We had these crazy founders. You know, it was Henry Kaiser. We think of Lockheed Martin, but it was Glenn Martin. It wasn't Northrop Grumman. It was Jack Northrop. You know, all of that innovation was not driven by faceless companies run by eighth generation leaders. They were built and, and run by these just maverick founders, people we would recognize their personality structure in the Valley today. Uh, I think as a, you know, as a consequence, after we won the Cold War, rightly, we expected a peace dividend. Why would you continue to, I, I think it's, it's hard for a legitimate de democracy to continue to sustain that level of spending in the absence of an adversary. So in 1993, uh, the then Secretary, Assistant uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, who was himself an entrepreneur, he started a Silicon Valley company called ESL, Labor uh, Electronic Systems Laboratories. Um, he had what was called the Last Supper. He invited the 51 defense primes. Today we have five. Back then we had 51. He invited the 51 defense primes in and he said, look, the budget is gonna get much smaller. And it did. For, for every dollar they had before, they had 33 cents going forward. Not all of you are gonna survive. I, I, I'm kind of giving you permission and a mandate to consolidate, to get lean, to get efficient. And so this is how we went from 50, 51 to five. And I think the offsided consequence of doing this is that the industrial base became less competitive. Oh, we only have five people to pick among. So, you know, prices are high or something like that. And there's some truth to that. But I think the much more profound consequence of The Last Supper is it began a deep financialization of defense. It became about dividends and buybacks and leverage ratios. It, you know, it became about M&A. New venture formation was about spin outs and mergers, not about venture backed, creative risk taking ideas to go build entirely new things. And so the financialization was a negative thing. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, okay. I, because it, it, all the emphasis went away from creative big idea. You know, Alex Karp says this all the time, it's like no great company was created primarily to make money. Like that's a, that, yes, there's a consequence to that and it has to happen, but you know, like, I, I don't think Larry and Sergey were like, hey, how do we make money? In fact, I think they were kind of pulled kicking and screaming into that part of it. But, you, you know, and so when, Suddenly, it was very much first a business that became quite challenging. And, and I think it also bred a sort of dysfunction in the relationship between government and what government calls industry, a term that really we don't use anywhere else when we talk about the partners you use to solve problems. And it's that like you're transactional, you're money grubbing, you know, I am doing this mission here. I, I, I've given up a lot to work in the government. And I think I, I don't, you know, I think we can we can really fix that. And we have this opportunity that's happened right now because of how much interest there is in defense tech. Just so I understand then, the problem is the mindset chasm between your profiteering private companies and we're here for a mission of being the government. Is that the core industrial problem? Well, I think that's a consequence of it. The core industrial problem is that we don't have a way to reward mavericks and innovators that we're breeding. We've historically bred a, a marketplace that's driven towards conformity. We all have the same business model. We all want to get paid by the hour. Hey, I don't want to take risk because um, I need to know you're going to buy this government. 
there's no way for VC to be applied here because I can't figure out how, you know, I can't figure out how to get to a scale of return that's going to matter. 